Oh. Hi everyone, I'm Linda Vu and I work in communications here at Berkeley Lab. I welcome to our very first Facebook Live ever on Berkeley Lab's uh, Facebook page. I'm here with astrophysicist Peter Nugent and UC Berkeley graduate student Danny Goldstein, and they're going to be talking about the, I've been practicing this, the first <laughs> multiply image gravitationally lens type 1A supernova. Yes. This Yay. Is really awesome. <laughs> So we're going to be taking your questions, so feel free to type them in the comments section below, and we'll get to them later in this, uh, in this chat. So why don't we start with what exactly did you find, and what does it mean for cosmology? So we found the first ever type 1A supernova that's light has been bent by gravity and distorted so that we can actually see it in four different places on the sky. So maybe we should just kind of break this down a little bit. Um, yeah. The supernova is actually at a distance of about four and a half billion light years away. This is much farther away than we ever find a uh, supernova in the survey that we do down at Palomar with only a 48-inch telescope. And it was perfectly aligned with a galaxy that was about uh, two and a half billion light years away. And because of the mass of the galaxy, it could actually bend space-time due to gravity, and it created these four images, which we see in the upper left, before making its way to Earth. It was this perfect alignment uh, that did this. And in addition to bending the light and making it into these four images, it also magnified the light, which allowed us to see such a distant supernova that we never get to see before. Now, you might be asking yourself, what is a type 1a supernova? Um, so a type 1a supernova is a violent explosion of a star at the end of its life. Uh, it gets so heavy that it can't support itself under its own weight, and it actually starts to contract. And it triggers a thermonuclear reaction inside of the star. It's basically like an H-bomb out in space, except it's 100 billion times as bright as the sun. And uh, we can see it all the way across the universe. So what does this mean for cosmology? So. Um, so you know, one of the most fundamental questions you can ask is, what's the story of the universe? How did it begin? Um, how has it changed and evolved to become what we see today? Uh, and what's it going to be like billions of years in the future after we're all long gone? And how we try to study this is we measure distances to objects across the universe. And this type of event, this gravitational lens of a supernova, allows us to measure distances with a precision which is almost unheard of in cosmology. Um, because each of these paths around the galaxy is a different length and light travels at the speed of light and that's constant, it will take a different amount of time for each of these images to arrive at Earth. And those differences in the time, the time delay between each of these images, actually then allows us to measure the distance to the lens and the distance to the supernova. So in the past kind of 20 years or so, scientists have converged on this model that the universe started in a hot big bang, it expanded and cooled over billions of years and formed structure like galaxies and stars and planets and life. Um, but as we get into this era where we're measuring the parameters that tell this story at this really incredible level of precision, we're actually starting to see that pieces of this story don't fit together the way that we think they should. And so, for example, if you make one of the most fundamental measurements you can make uh, the, of the speed at which galaxies are flying away from each other out in space, uh, you get a different answer if you measure it assuming this standard model than you do if you measure it in a different way. And so, the significance of this discovery and really why it's so cool is that it, it, it kind of marks the beginning of a new era in cosmology, of adding a new tool to our toolbox that is ideally suited to resolving these kinds of inconsistencies and telling us whether our understanding of fundamental physics actually needs to be modified, if there's something wrong with a standard model, or if there's been some kind of a systematic error somewhere uh, in the measurements that have already been made that's maybe been overlooked. So this is the first one that's ever been discovered. How hard is it to find these things? Uh, 
they're incredibly hard to find. If we could uh, show the um, the nurse slide, uh, yeah. That, let's go to the other. Let's go to the other slide of the quarry. Yeah. So this is what we do each night uh, with the Palomar Transient Factory uh, and the in interim Palomar Transient Factory. We take images, and these images are about the size of the moon, with the resolution each pixel is about the size of a dime at one mile. So this is a very high resolution image for such a, a small telescope. And we take these images and then we come back and we take a new image and then we difference them and we get these subtractions. Now, if it was just plain and easy as that, we'd be done. But as you can see on this image, there's lots of junk on there. And right here in the blue is the galaxy that was the lens. And you can see the difference, and that's the supernova. But there's all this other stuff that's on there. And all that other stuff could be other supernova. Um, maybe not necessarily gravitationally lensed ones, but they could be all different kinds of things. They could be stars getting brighter and then dimmer. They could be uh, black holes and distant galaxies swallowing stars. Um, or they could be junk. Yeah, and or a lot of time, be, it's it, just junk. Yeah, they could be satellites going overhead. They could be, uh, you know, pixels getting saturated or too hot. Hit by a cosmic ray, any one of a number of things. We take 3,000 of these images every single night, uh, and uh, we run subtractions on them, and we generate about a million of these detections, just like that one with the supernova. We use uh, the Cori uh, supercomputer here at NERSC to process this imaging data, and we run machine learning algorithms on it to let us know, is this garbage or is this a real object? And typically, we find one to two new events every single night. So it's about a one in a million type of thing that we're doing. Well, we've been running this for almost a 1,000 days. And over that time, we found thousands upon thousands of supernova. And this is our first ever uh, gravitationally lensed supernova. So out of all the supernova, we sort of predict it's a 1 in 50,000. If we find 50,000 supernova, we'll see one of these. But we find one or two new supernova every million of these objects that we find. So it's literally a 1 in several billion uh, that we were able to do this. So before we get back into how rare these things are, I just wanted to um, talk to any Facebook followers that have just tuned in. We're talking with Peter Nugent, an astrophysicist here at Berkeley Lab, and UC Berkeley graduate student Danny Goldstein about their recent supernova discovery and uh, their methods for finding supernova and how they're going to find more of these rare events. So Peter, to get back to how rare these are, I remember in a conversation that we had, you mentioned when you were defending your PhD thesis decades ago, uh, just <laughs> two, decades two decades ago, ago, two decades ago. <laughs> that you could only that you that one of your goals in your career would to be would to be to find one of these events. Um, and so, so this was the coolest possible thing you could find, oh yeah. right? To twenty years ago, there's there's no question that I was I was asked a question by the outside member of my committee, what would be the coolest thing that you could possibly find? now that you're going off to Berkeley Lab working on a supernova discovery program. And I said, a gravitationally lensed supernova. And, and the reason being is, A, it's just neat. It's, it's such a great thing to see Einstein's theory of general relativity in action, uh, looking at one of the objects which I did my PhD thesis on. Can we, can, we the, uh, can we yeah. show the, the, the other image the, with the, the, the panel? The panel one? Yeah. So yeah. here is the supernova being split into four different images by this galaxy. These are each zoom-ins. This is sort of like the size of the sky that we take the PTF images on. Yeah. And then here's a zoom-in just on the galaxy. Okay. And this is not that, that far apart. And then this is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. And then this is an image uh, from the Keck 10-meter telescope with uh, laser guide star adaptive optics. And the cool thing that you can see is not only do you see the four images of the supernova, but in the Keck image, you see that ring. Those are called Einstein rings. That's actually the galaxy that's 4.5 billion light years away that hosts the Type 1a supernova. It gets 
because it's perfectly aligned, it smears out into this lovely ring right around where the individual supernova images are. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of scale, kind of the, the separation between the center of one of those two images, pan panel images on the right, and one of the images of the supernova is about one-third of one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. So we're looking at scales that are almost unimaginably, unimaginably small. So we found one. You've been searching for 20 plus years. Um, how, what's the next step? How do we find more of these? We're going to turn this into a cottage industry <laughs> and find a whole bunch more of these things and use them to measure the rate at which the universe is expanding at, at unprecedented levels of precision. The, the idea behind this is, is really very, very simple. Um, we know that the lenses um, are almost always going to be a certain type of a galaxy called an elliptical galaxy, which is filled old, with old, old dead red stars. Red dead stars, nothing going on, about as simple as you can get. And the great thing about these galaxies are they have two properties which make them perfect for finding more of these objects. The first is that because they're old and dead, their colors, their red, how much red light they have, how much blue light they have, they have very little blue light, are very, very stable. And we can actually use that to tell us how far away they are, approximately. The other great thing about elliptical galaxies is that the only type of supernova they ever host are type 1As. So we came up with this very simple method which says, we'll look at elliptical galaxies, Look for supernovae that go off, that look like they're going off on top of elliptical galaxies, and basically just test against the hypothesis that that supernova is a supernova happening in that galaxy. And because of the lensing, gravitational lensing, you often strongly magnify a supernova behind it. And even though that supernova could be very far away, in this case it's almost twice as far away. It's light gets magnified by so much. Factor of 50 in this case. It's 50 times brighter than it, than than it, should, it should be. be. It actually looks like it's brighter than it could be in this galaxy. And since elliptical galaxies are so easy we can measure the distance to them, it, it makes it just trivial to find these things. And the great thing is we don't have to see all of these lensed images. All we have to do is see a supernova that's too bright for the galaxy that it's in. So we have so, a, sorry, we just have a question from Facebook. Uh, Ruben Morales actually is asking for a clarification. Okay. So the supernova that was discovered was actually in the galaxy. So this image is actually the host galaxy and the supernova, correct? The so we see the three whole things thing here. here. Yeah. yeah. This right here is the lens. These are the supernova images. And this right here is, is the host galaxy. host galaxy of the supernova getting bent by the lens. Okay. Yeah. So, and that's what this is right here. This is the lens galaxy that's okay. two and a half billion light years. So away. it's basically Earth. The the yeah. The, can we go back to the video? Yeah. Can yeah, we go sorry. back to the video? We can see this quite easily here. Yeah. So you get the supernova, you get the galaxy light, and you get the galaxy that's behind it. Yeah, here we go. Supernova back there, you got your lens galaxy in between us and the supernova, and it's bending the light from the supernova into four different images. Okay. Also, I just want to say one last thing about our method for finding more of these things. It all rests on this beautiful observation about type 1a supernova, that they're what we call standard candles. And basically what that means is that they almost always have exact, more or less the same brightness. So that's what allows us to determine if they're quote unquote too bright. Because we all know they should be in a certain brightness range, so if they appear brighter than that, then we know there has to be some other force at play that's actually making them brighter than they should be. Okay, so before we get back to the questions, uh, so for those of you just tuning in now, I'm here with Peter Nugent, uh, astrophysicist here at Berkeley Lab, and Danny Goldstein, a UC Berkeley graduate student. And they're talking about their recent supernova discovery their, uh, and its significance in, uh, in cosmology. So send in your questions. We're taking them now. We're answering them. Um, so post them in the comments section below, and we'll get to them um, as quickly as we can. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, you know. Well, so one of the great things um, about this method is that um, beforehand, the, one of the next generation uh, telescope surveys that um, uh, DOE is, is working on is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And this is going to be a survey that just sort of plows the sky every night in a whole bunch of different colors. Uh, and because of how large a telescope it is, it's an 8 meter eight class meter, telescope, yeah. and the size of the imager, um, uh, they'll be able to go to huge distances. But because they survey such a huge amount of sky as well, we'll see tons of potential lens galaxies, millions of them. And our method, what's great about it is originally they predicted we might find 50 or so of these objects with LSST, which is great, but isn't, you know, we'd like to be able, to, Yeah, we'd like to be able to find more. Yeah, and so what, what Danny and I showed in, in our paper is we're actually going to find more like 500 or more. About of, 10 of times these more, yeah. And so the whole, the whole uh, uh, reason for that is that the, the previous calculation assume that you had to actually be able to see the multiple images in the LSST image in order to find one of these things. LSST would have never even found this, this guy. Yeah. Um, the Palomar Transient Factory, which is a, a much smaller telescope, never resolved all these individual images. And so that's what our method allows you to do, is to take a telescope whose resolving power is nice, but yeah. not great, and make it so much better by using this method of finding a supernova that's too bright for its own galaxy. So I've got a user question that's going to tie into that. So Assem Khalifa is asking, is it extremely difficult to find a gravitationally lens supernova? So kind of going back to your explanation about how, you know, you're, you're kind of, you didn't expect that these telescopes would be able to find no. these things, um, but the Palomar Transient Factory did. What is... So how difficult was that, and what does that mean? It was kind of a, a discovery. It was a serendipitous discovery. It was, it was not, we were not actually looking for events like this. It was just discovered and, by chance. And, in, and we'll, we'll, we'll shame ourselves a little bit here. We didn't actually get on to the supernova until a little bit later, because we waited for it to get brighter and brighter until it was easy enough to get a spectrum of it. If we knew what we had from the beginning, we would have been honored immediately. Um, so basically what we have to do is that pipeline that I described where we're weeding through a million objects every night, we have to add one more layer to it. And that layer is basically assembling a catalog of all the potential lensing galaxies that are out there. And then measuring uh, you know, the best distance we can to them and then looking at each new detection that comes in and saying, is this a supernova in the galaxy? Is it some sort of artifact? Is it a black hole swallowing a star in that galaxy? Or is it a gravitationally lens supernova? And we have to ask that question every single time an image is taken because we want to get on these things as quickly as possible. But just from a physics perspective, just to kind of uh -huh. uh, go, come back to that question a little bit, to gravitationally lens a supernova, you have to get three things to line up in a very, 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 very precise alignment. Um, space is really big, and it's mostly empty. Uh, so getting that alignment when you've got so much empty space and things that are spread out over you know, massive, massive separations between them is not easy. Yeah, it's, it's that chance alignment of the lens and the supernova and us which is the rare thing. So Ruben Morales has a follow-up question. Uh, he's asking, how do these galaxies help us, or these uh, gravitationally lensed supernova, help us study the cosmic expansion? So, yeah, I'll take that one. So uh, traditionally, what, what, what's been done with supernova cosmology is we know <laughs> how bright a, a type 1a supernova is. And so, uh, by looking at how bright it appears to be to us, we can actually infer how far away from us it is. Uh, just like if you've got a 100-watt light bulb and you hold it really close to your face, it's going to be really bright. But if you put it down the block, it's going to appear to be much dimmer. It's exactly the same thing with supernova. Um, a brighter supernova, type 1a supernova, is closer to us. And a dimmer one means it's further away. Uh, 
Now, because light travels at a finite speed, uh, the distance to a supernova is actually telling us about how long ago the supernova happened in the past. So distance is a measure of light travel time. And one of the weird things about living in an expanding universe is that as space expands, light that's moving through it actually gets redder um, because uh, if light's a wave and as space expands, the crests of the wave get further and further apart from each other, which causes the light to lose energy and become redder. So, uh, so we can figure out how far away a supernova was by looking at how bright it is and therefore how far back in the past it happened. And we can figure out how much the universe is stretched in that time by looking at how red the supernova and so that kind of analysis, which Peter was involved with and Saul Perlmutter led the Supernova Cosmology Project here at Berkeley Lab, uh, resulted in the Nobel Prize in Physics just a couple years ago. And so we're doing a totally different measurement than that. Yeah. We're still using type 1a supernova, but we're not actually measuring the distance to the supernova anymore. No. Now what we're doing is we're measuring the difference in distances to that the light for the individual images places. travels. So can we go back to the video for a sec? So it turns out that these uh, trajectories are not actually the same length. Uh, this one might actually be a little bit uh, further, a, a little bit longer uh, than, uh, than the one next to it. These could be days or weeks or just hours difference in time. And if we can measure the supernova, say, rising and falling, and we get a nice measurement of when it hits its peak, and we can do that in one of the images, and then the other image appears a day or two later, and we can measure that peak, we can actually get the time delay difference, and then hence the difference in each of these paths. And because we know that the universe has expanded the same, you know, over the distance between the lens and the supernova, that actually gives us a really incredible measurement of how fast the universe is expanding between those two uh, lines, sight lines to the images. So it's building on decades and decades of pioneering research that's been done here at Berkeley Lab by just taking it in a, in a different direction. Yep. So we have about five minutes left. Um, so please send in your questions. We're still taking them. Um, but before we uh, end, I wanted to talk a bit about the supernova pipeline that's running here on our supercomputers at the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, which is a DOE user facility here at Berkeley Lab. Because um, it was something that you kind of pioneered. I remember Danny mentioning like the beginning of his astronomy oh, yeah. career the game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was basically like looking at these uh, observations every night at little dots and seeing. Yeah, so it used to be pretty hard to find supernova. Um, my very first thing that I ever did uh, doing research in astronomy about 10 years ago, was looking for supernova by eye. I, I was a freshman in college, and you know there was this big survey, kind of like PTF, but we didn't have this nice fancy pipeline. We had to actually look at every single dot that showed up on one of those images by eye and try and see if it was a supernova or not. Yeah. And the big thing that we've done here, and, and Danny's done a lot of this work on our, on our current supernova survey, uh, that we're doing at High Redshift, the Dark Energy Survey, is try to automate this, remove the humans. Uh, when, when I was here 20 years ago with Saul, there would be 10 of us staring at images, doing the same thing Danny was on the supernova survey he worked on when he was a freshman. And after a while, okay, that's great if you only have a handful of images, but if you're getting 3,000 images and that's coming in every night, it's just impossible. So we had to let the computers work for us and do most of the work by basically letting them learn from human beings to start. Human beings would tag the data, say that's a supernova, that isn't. Uh, Danny worked hard on putting fake supernova into our images and then watching them go all the way through the pipeline and saying, okay, that's a real one, that isn't, let's train on that. And we run these machine learning codes to basically separate the wheat from the chaff and this is a million to one type of separation uh, so that we can find these objects and follow them up. And it's, and it's impossible without pushing our work through, uh, flows through a supercomputing center like NERSC. So can you describe how the pipeline works? Basically, um, a telescope is taking pictures. What happens next? 
or scanning 30 the seconds sky later, they're, they're shutters read out. Yep. San Images. Diego up to to the Bay microwave area. relay down the mountain <laughs> to San Diego gets on to uh, ESnet from the San Diego Supercomputing Center up to NERSC. Uh, goes into a large file system that we have here uh, for the project and then a database is just asking the question is there a new image? Great. If there's a new image, does it have a reference image? Great. I'll now run a subtraction. It sends it off to the computer to do that. Every 30 seconds about 10 images come in. Boom, boom, boom. It does those, processes it, shoves the answers back into a database and then and this is the great part. We have collaborators like Ariel Gubar, who's the lead author on the science paper, who are over in Europe. It's nighttime here. I don't want to be up looking <laughs> at discoveries, but it's the time when he's having his espresso in the morning and looking at the discoveries. And he can go through and say, ah, this is interesting. Let's turn another telescope on it. And in this case, we turned on uh, the uh, Palomar 60-inch telescope with the SED machine that could take a spectrum of it and that was the first thing that showed us that this supernova was not like the one we were expecting to see. But that whole process from the shutter closing on the camera on the telescope to Ariel being able to look through and decide what's cool and interesting to follow up happens in about what 30 seconds? Uh, 30 seconds to push stuff through about four more minutes before everything gets loaded up onto a beautiful web page so you can just click buttons All right. and go well, through. It's, it's really, really fast. It's, uh, and it's, it's definitely something that would have been nice uh, <laughs> 10 years ago, 10 years 20 ago years ago. ago. Started now. Yeah. Yes. So in our last couple minutes, uh, another question. So Ruben Morales, again, he's, uh, he's wondering what's the next step? Can you find more of these? With like next generation surveys and how you know and how um, and how could we use this or how is this pipeline being used as a tool for cosmology? So and these oh, events, sorry, sorry, <laughs> these uh, events and these tools. So two surveys are coming up that uh, Peter and I are really excited about. Uh, one is starting in just August. three months. Yeah, yeah August. in August. Uh, it's, wow, it's really soon. It's called the Zwicky Transient Facility. It's basically the same collaboration as uh, IPTF, which discovered this supernova, but they're taking off the camera and replacing it with one that's about 10 times as big. Yeah. So we're going to cover about 10 times as much of the sky uh, per night as we would be able to with this survey. So that's going to uh, really, really increase the number of these that we're going to be able to find. We sort of, our calculations right now, based sort of on the way ZTF is going to operate, suggests we should find three of these every year, so one every few months. Now, if we wait a few more years, the next telescope that Dana's going to talk about, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, we basically expect them to find one of these every single week. And if we can work on our physics a little bit and our astronomy and, and do measurements a little bit better than we've been doing in the past, we should be able to make percent, few percent measurements of the expansion of the universe to every single one of these objects. Uh, and that's going to be the great thing, to have several hundred of these things uh, doing something uh, at a level which has never been done before. So with that many, how, uh, how like, accurate do you think we'll be able to measure universal So to measure expansion? the expansion rate of the universe, less than 1%. Wow. Yeah. So that'll put it up there with uh, other of, of the most advanced cosmological probes that are out there right now, the cosmic microwave background, uh, the baryon acoustic oscillations. It'll be right up there with any of those experiments. And, and we get it for free. Um, LSST is going to take this data already. ZTF will take this data. We'll find them. Well, cool. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today, guys. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for having us. Um, for those of you watching, if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, we're still taking them. So feel free to fill them in the comments section, and we'll try to get to them in the next day or so. And if you're not all already following Berkeley Lab on Facebook, please do, and you'll get an update for all our future Facebook Live events and cutting-edge science news. So thanks so much for watching. Cool. See ya.